Hello and welcome to episode three of the Croydon Constitutionalist podcast, bringing classical liberalism to South London and beyond via YouTube, Stitcher and Apple Podcasts. My name is Dan Heaton and my partner in podcasting today is Mike Swaddling, the co-founder of the Croydon Constitutionalist. Mike, what have we got to discuss today? Hello, Dan. So today we've got, uh, we're talking about Brexit, the extended transition that's been proposed, Project Cheer, all the good news, and the street stall, street stall we recently held in Croydon. Um, Canada and cannabis. Uh, some of you will note that uh, Canada has recently uh, legalised cannabis, how that's working out. And the new proposals for hate crime in Britain. Hate crime against the elderly and the hatreds of men and women. And finally, our usual uh, roundup on events in Croydon. Cheers, Mike. So Brexit, uh, that, that old favourite, it's, it's not getting sorted at the moment, is it? Um, so what's happened in, since the last podcast? Well, uh, Theresa May seems to wish to continue to kick the can down the road. To this extent, we seem to be talking now about extending the transition period for anywhere up to a year. And we are going to have to pay for the privilege whilst having no say whatsoever over any rules that are imposed upon us uh, because we won't have any representation in the commission. Uh, Mike, sound like a plan for you? I, it's unbelievable that, that someone can sort of suggest we don't know a solution, so we just delay things because that will make it better. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's joyous in a way to see the complete incompetence of this government rolling out and out and out on these Brexit negotiations. Um, the DUP have come out against it, uh, wondering what the point is. Jacob Rees-Mogg has come out against it and, and therefore the European Research Group have come out uh, wondering what the point is. What's the point of Theresa May? Um, why, why does something that can't get done in two years get done in two years and three months? And answers on a postcard, please. Well, I mean, we've been waiting for, well, it took them nine months to actually uh, issue the Article 50 notice when we were promised that if we voted to leave the European Union, that David Cameron, well, firstly, he would stick around to see it all through. And he said that he would issue the notice the following day. But no, they waited nine months before they issued that notice. Then they've got the two year time period for for negotiating a trade deal, a, a future relationship and a, and a withdrawal agreement. They decided they wanted an extra two-year transition period. Now, OK, um, th this helps the European Union to some extent because it means that they get all the money they would have got had we have remained in the European Union because they have these seven-year budgetary periods. If the, we continue the transition period for any length of time, it's going to cost us money. I've seen some suggestion of £10 billion. But who knows? Because at the moment, we don't know how long that period is going to be. Theresa is saying, oh, it'll only be a few months. But others are saying, well, it'll have to be a year. Um, we really don't know. And what we, we may end up in is, is a state of limbo where we're just simply paying to be a member of a club that we're not really in. We're getting not so much of the benefits, but we're having to pay the, for the privilege. Just picking up there, down on the £10 billion. Now, uh, universal credit is not being fully funded. Figures are about two to three billion pounds. Universal Credit was an idea supported by Ian Duncan Smith and Frank Field. It's been working to get people out of the trap of being better off in, in, in welfare than in work. This is a positive thing. The drawback we have at the moment is it's not been fully funded. That funding is, as I say, two to three billion pounds a year, yet we're proposing to give to the EU 10 billion pounds in one year. Now, I've written to Chris Phil on Twitter uh, to ask him why, whether he can confirm those numbers. Uh, the next step clearly is to ask him whether he thinks that, that the Conservative government is more interested in giving money to Eurocrats than it is to um, the people of this country. And... and and I'd I say the government benches, the cabinet seem to be wanting to do this. I don't, don't for one minute think most backbenchers will want to do that. And I would encourage people to write to their MP with those very thoughts why you won't fund universal credit, but you will fund the EU. Uh, and it, it's a shameful place that we find ourselves in. I think most MPs in their surgeries know how bad an idea that is. And putting a little bit of pressure will go a long way. Yeah, and, and, and the... The proposal, just in general, has been has been very poorly received. I think from 
MPs of, of all sides of the House, as, as you said, why, why should something that, you know, why will a few extra months or, or a few extra years or who knows uh, get the job done uh, when they won't have done it in, in two years or uh, two years and nine months or whatever the, the situation has been. Um, and we're all seem we're, we're doing this to uh, assist with the Irish backstop situation. Well, we discussed this on the uh, on the last podcast. Uh, and Theresa's saying that the European Union wants insurance on the insurance. Well, there must be a solution. The European Union has said that it doesn't want a hard border. The Irish say they don't want a hard border. We say that we don't want to hard border. Just don't put a border in. It's quite simple. The opposite of doing something is to do nothing. So just don't do it. <laughs> I was listening to Daniel Hannan on a Spectator podcast today. Uh, and I believe it was the one entitled and quite surprising from the spectator, uh, "What a shit show." Um, was Daniel Hannan was talking about uh, this very issue, and and he said, "How can you start any negotiation? And it could be a negotiation for buying a house or for leaving the EU. It doesn't really matter what it is. Where your starting premise is, whatever ever happens, we will accept the, your most aggressive terms, which is the backstop." So that's where Theresa May has got. She said, whatever is agreed, whatever we cut, if we can't get everything agreed, worst case scenario, you'll get everything you want. Now, could you imagine going to buy a car that's, and starting off with, whatever else happens, if we can't agree to lower the price or that I can pay you in part cash, part check, whatever, it, or, you know, pay you in a couple of weeks to, once it's been running, whatever else happens, I'll give you everything right now up front if we can't agree anything else, how far you'll get with that car car discussion utterly ludicrous uh, he spelt it out really well and and that is the appalling state of affairs we've got the only possible way around this now i can see is whether it's it's the prime minister the current prime minister or a future one you go you start from scratch again you go back in and say we've rejected everything we've agreed so far you know apologize frankly and say here's the new plan yeah, the government, has, and whether it's the civil servants or, or the prime minister or various government ministers, have been definitely outplayed uh, by the EU on this one, uh, just in terms of negotiating skills. I, I often wonder about these people, have they ever negotiated anything in their lives? You know, I joke, maybe the, the most aggressive negotiation they've ever had was when they were looking to buy their second holiday home or something like that, because really... You know, any professional negotiator would never fall for these, these, uh, these traps. Uh, so that's where we are with Brexit at the moment. It's uh, it's not looking good for the Prime Minister, but um, as things presently stand, we even if there's no deal, we will leave the European Union in March of next year. Hurrah! Uh, and there's plenty to be cheerful about. We we discussed last week some of the. Um, the issues that are being raised by the Project Fear merchants, and uh, I thoroughly, uh, between the two of us, we thoroughly debunked those suggestions. Uh, but we have some very good news that's come out in the in the past week or so. Uh, Project Cheer, as I as I like to describe it. Uh, so, notwithstanding all of the uncertainties that we are we are told are affecting the UK economy, unemployment fell by forty seven thousand people in the three months to August is now down to 4%, and youth unemployment is the lowest that's ever been recorded, which is uh, pretty good considering all the alleged uncertainty and all of the catastrophe that is going to happen uh, if it was uh, a Brexit no deal. Um, and what's more, there's 338,000 new full-time jobs have been added to the UK economy in the last year, so the economy is seemingly doing very well, but the economy could do much better once we've left the European Union, because America uh, is very much looking forward to doing a free trade deal with us. You may remember uh, Barack Obama saying that we would be at the back of the queue for any such trade deals uh, during the referendum campaign. Well, apparently that doesn't seem to be the case, uh, because the US Trade Representative has issued a 90-day notice order to, the, to Congress uh, so what that means is that under uh, U.S. law, the the executive part of the of the uh, the government is able to negotiate trade deals on behalf of the country, but to do so, it has to give Congress ninety days notice, and it has done that. And in that notice, it says um, 
Congress intends to commence trade negotiations with the UK and goes on to say the first and fifth largest of economies in the world uh, as will, will negotiate trade as soon as is uh, possible after the UK has left the European Union on March the 29th. Uh, so as I say, we're not at the back of the queue, we are at the front of the queue. Um, and we've talked briefly there about um, how Theresa May uh, really does need to, to get her act together on these negotiations. Well, another way of saying that would be that Theresa May needs to wake up and smell the coffee. And the coffee does in fact smell good. Uh, because Starbucks, uh, which is uh, originally an American company, has decided to close its Amsterdam office... Uh, which is not so good for Amsterdam. However, they are moving the jobs to London as they are going to consolidate the European HQ in London, notwithstanding Brexit. So really is a lot of uh, good news on the Brexit front, um, notwithstanding the the stalls and the the stalling of the negotiations. The economy is doing well. The economy can do better when we are free from the European Union and free to strike our own trade deals. Mike, nicely cheered up? Uh, it, it's it's great news. The, the you know the economy is doing well at the moment. Uh, it's taken a long time since the uh, great great recession of uh, the late till two thousand eight, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, um, and we're seeing a lot of progress. And uncertainty does stop business investing, um, but but equally opportunity makes business invest. And and we're seeing here example after example where business not not. The CBI, not the IMF, not the not the uh, Ramona uh, industrial chiefs that have never never actually built a business themselves. Actual real businessmen on the ground that make investment decisions are are growing our economy and and making moves to Britain, not away from Britain. And that's great news, and it, and it indicates a great future ahead for us. Indeed. Uh, And finally, just wrapping up on on the events in Brexit, as it were, Uh, Mike, we as the the Croydon Constitutionalists and the the Vote Leave campaign uh, in the Croydon area, we held a street stall recently. Uh, How did that go? Yes, so we were out uh, last weekend uh, in Croydon um, on the North End and and handing out uh, better off out leaflets. So that's, that's a part of the Freedom Association. And they've got a couple of leaflets uh, talking about the dangers that Brexit is under from Theresa May and from uh, the, why, why we really shouldn't listen to Tony Blair and Jean-Claude Glunker, or whatever his name is, uh, who, who really want to take away the reasons we voted for Brexit. And the leaflet reminds us that it's a freedom to make our own laws, our own trade deals, own our borders, regenerate our farming and fishing industries and get our money back. All things we've really touched upon already. Great, great day out. There was quite a few of us there. Had some friends over from Bromley. It was good to see them, and and thanks for that. Um, We were seen by thousands of people, handed out many hundreds of leaflets. Uh, There's a couple of videos doing the round on social media of myself and Dan um, talking about why we were there. And and getting out there and getting those those videos up on social media, sure, we were seen by thousands and thousands and thousands more. They... They really are effective on Facebook and Twitter and, you know, really like to encourage you when we've got a street store to get down and help us because it's good fun on the day. But also, if you can do a 30 second piece for camera to us, for us, and we, we get you out doing that, we can get uh, thousands more impressions and people seeing the passion with which we see Brexit happening. Lots of likes on social media as well, which, again, it just it, it, it reinforces his reinforces people's view of of brexit now you certainly got speaking to a few interesting people on the day how did that go yeah it, it went really well yeah certainly a diverse bunch of people were uh, coming from to, to us speaking us to us uh, at the stall uh, not necessarily the sort of people that the remainers would have you believe are brexit supporters um, people from all kinds of backgrounds all kinds of ages uh, some people who were first or second generation um, immigrants, uh, for example. Um, and yeah, they, they're all of the opinion that we really do need to, to get out and get out as, as quickly as possible from the European Union. Uh, not very impressed with the way that Theresa May was negotiating matters, notwithstanding what their normal political allegiance uh, might be. 
Uh, but yeah, it was it was very good to to meet these people. It's always good to press the flash, and um, and it was a great reception from those from those people. Um, I think we've got a couple of street stalls that we're, we're going to be doing um, in the next uh, month or so. Uh, Mike, have you got some dates for those? Yeah, so we plan to be in Addiscombe from eleven a.m. till one p.m. on November the seventeenth, and in Thornton Heath from again eleven a.m. to one p.m. On the twenty fourth of November, um, Addiscombe would be probably around the co op. Thornton Heath would be around Tesco. Uh, we we firm some of that up, and it will be on our emails. But I'll get in touch. But it'd be great to see you join us. Um, great to get out uh, in the communities of Croydon, re- re- reminding people for the need to make sure we get the Brexit that Britain voted for. Great stuff. Great stuff. Look forward to seeing many people out uh, at those street stalls. Well, finally, moving on from from Brexit, um, we thought we'd moved on from it two years ago, but it still goes on. Uh, some interesting developments in Canada um, over the last uh, week or so. They've decided to decriminalise or legalise the the wacky backy. Um, drug decriminalisation uh, is an interesting topic. Um, you know, we'll. we'll Think about prohibition of, of alcohol back in the uh, in the 1920s in the United States, which didn't go down uh, too well. It led to the uh, increase in the the, the mafia and organised crime. Um, so, so how are they going about doing this? Well, um, yeah, they they legalised it. I think it was back on Wednesday. Um, but how is this going to work in practice? Well, it's an interesting way they're going about it. They haven't just sort of decriminalised it, which is I think is pretty much what's happened in. Holland uh, some time ago they've become the there's only the second country to fully legalize it um, and and they're going to regulate it quite stringently which then becomes a, an interesting concept of well is the government actually get involved in drug dealing um th- what they've done is that the the federal government because they've got a federal system in Canada has legalized pot as it were uh, but is leaving it to the provinces, so the Canadian equivalent of states, as you'd have in America, uh, to administer this, to to regulate it. So uh, different states and different cities will do this differently. But in Ontario, which has got the, by far the, the biggest population uh, centre in Canada, uh, they've decided to set up their own, well, drug stores, as it were, um, to sell pot. Now, I know that this is a thing they do in Ontario, so you can't simply buy booze in a supermarket in Ontario like you can in England. You have to go to a state-approved off-license, effectively. And so they've decided to to take that same approach to um, to the, the selling of pot, basically. So, Mike, what's your what's your view on firstly the decriminalisation of pot, and secondly the fact that certainly in some parts of Canada the state's going to be well selling it yes it's uh it's an interesting one isn't it i i i passionately view that government shouldn't be telling you what you can and can't put into your own body um however i am a bit more practical than that i'm not totally libertarian in in that sense that that i'm i'm some sort of legalization some framework similar to the way we sell alcohol or cigarettes in this country is appropriate now i think some of the, the rules around cigarettes have gone a little bit potty but um uh, some sort of rules around that are are, are appropriate and you know it, it, we do need a way to breathalyze someone or the equivalent you do need a way to keep it away from kids um but taking it out of the hands of illegal gangs and actually giving you your freedom whether it's god given or birth given whatever phrase you're comfortable with the freedom you had the day you were born to do your what you want with your own body there's no way the government should take that away from you so in in many ways it's a sensible positive step from canada um the government government pot stores i it seems crazy to me uh, much much better likely more likely to be effectively administered through a supermarket chains and private businesses the government is inefficient in really everything it does because it doesn't have competition if you give it to the to the stores um they will run that much better but with a, a degree of government regulation seems a perfectly sensible approach the real risk and the, the risk i do see and i can understand why canadians would be upset by this is the problem with your the leading 
um, edge of this kind of change is you attract a certain type of person to your country. Anyone that's been to Amsterdam, and Amsterdam's actually track, uh, cut down on drug use, I believe, but anyone that went to Amsterdam 15, 20 years ago will know there were a lot of people around who were clearly uh, who clearly taken a lot of substances um and and it didn't make it always the nicest place to be and there's a risk for canada that that being at the the bleeding edge of this they find themselves in the same place but you know uh, it's it's a good it's it's good that freedom is being allowed to people to make their own choices um like everything i suspect the execution will uh, pan out some more details yeah, I think you're right. It'll be interesting to see if uh, tourism from the United States picks up, particularly just uh, popping across uh, Lake Ontario, as it were. Um, well, that's that's what we think. You know, obviously, we we believe in personal liberty. But what do what what do you think? Uh, do get in touch on this subject and other issues. But we're particularly keen to know on on this particular issue. Uh, Mike, how can people get in contact with us? So on Twitter, we're at Croydon Const. On Facebook, we're at Croydon Constitutionalists. Our website, which is croydonconstitutionalists.uk and email croydonconstitutionalists at gmail.com. Great stuff. Uh, Moving on, uh, some new announcements of proposals this week in terms of hate crime. Uh, Well, I hate crime, so what is a a hate crime? Well, um, a hate crime... from a, a legal perspective, what it does is if you are convicted of something that is a hate crime, um, you, you the, the judge is allowed to give you basically a stronger sentence um, if they believe that your criminal activity displayed hateful behaviour towards the victim uh, based on a number of characteristics, e.g. their ethnicity, their religion or their sexual orientation or the perceived religion, ethnicity, or sexual orientation, um, amongst other things. Um, which, which basically means that uh, a judge can decide to, to give you a strong, a harsher sentence if you beat up one person rather than beating up a different person, if they, if they have this perception that that's why you did it. Um, I thought there was one rule for everybody, but it, it does seem a bit... Um, unfortunate, but in any event, the, the the new proposal is to extend this definition to include hate towards women in general, but also men in general, and also the elderly. And um, before we go on to the, the detail of this, Mike, well, what's your view on this sort of hate crime legislation? Hate the 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 problem with the hate crime is it it's a in the eye of the beholder, it's a perception thing. Someone sits there and says, I can tell what's in your heart or what's in your mind. Now, I I don't know. In my all my years, I've never been able to tell what's in someone else's heart or mind. Uh, it's amazing that these politicians and these judges seem to think they can. Um, to be fair to the judges, they are put in that position by the, the politicians. Um, the I, and, and fundamentally, you are actions, not what you think is how we normally judge people in society. You can think... All sorts of things. We all do things in life that we don't enjoy, but we do them because we are good people. The the thought about it is not not the factor. It's the doing or not doing and taking actions and and judging people based on their thoughts, which is what hate crime is, is ludicrous. But it gets worse. The worse is that it's my judgment of what you're doing, not even your own judgment. So I've decided that you hit me because I'm a man, not you hit me because I was acting like a fool uh, or I I was aggressive or whatever it might be. Um, I've decided you hit me because you thought I was a Muslim. I've decided you've hit me because, and it, you know, fill in the blank. And and how wildly open to misinterpretation could that be? Um, These are, they're a bad idea now. And, And we saw an example locally not long after the referendum in Shirley, in the Shrubland estate, where there was an incredibly vicious and wrong attack on a, on a young man up there. This was branded as a racist hate crime, uh, and it was all branded about Brexit. Now, as people were involved in the campaign in Croydon, we didn't go up to Shrublands apart from leafleting for a, uh, a public meeting. So not an area we were particularly involved in. Uh, not that we wouldn't have been, we just didn't have the, the bodies to cover everywhere. 
Um, it then turned out that that half the attackers were of ethnic origins, non-white. Um, so, so the racism went, but then it was a hate crime because he was a refugee. Then it turned out no one seemed to know about that, and they'd actually met him in the pub, not in the on the road where they'd seen him. And lie after lie after lie got told, and and the whole issue gets ratcheted up. And I don't know where it ended up, but but certainly some people were prosecuted for it. All of this proves the nonsense that deciding why someone done something is what you're deciding is what they done. The act of aggression, the act of attacking someone is the problem, not whether you've done it because you're a fool or you don't like them or it was just on Monday. It doesn't matter why you've done it. It matters what you've done. Agreed. It, all this stuff may be, you know, well-meaning, I suspect, giving them the, these people the benefit of the doubt, but really it, it just seems crazy to me. You, shouldn't not, you should not be attacking people whoever they are, uh, whatever they look like, or, or anything. On this latest point of hate, hate-filled hate crimes against the, the elderly, I just I can't believe that there are people who hate the elderly. Well, apart from the Romaniacs who believe that all old people shouldn't be allowed to vote. But, getting off Brexit if we can, um, it, people don't hate the elderly. People may attack an elderly person... Because they think they because if they mug them they think they won't fight back because they're they're a bit frail or vulnerable, and you and you may wish to think that that's that makes them particularly unpleasant people, but I don't think anybody's attacked an elderly person because they hate the elderly, and it's just but again it, it's just going to give the judges uh, put them in a very invidious position of having to try to see you know, mind read people um, if they, if they bring this sort of thing in. Can I just say, we do have a problem with crime on our streets, particularly in London uh, at the moment. It's particularly around knife crime. What's that problem? Is it because we don't have the laws? Is it because stabbing people is OK unless you do it in a hateful way? Is it because you're allowed to go around and, and mug people or because you're allowed to, to, to take other people's property and, and, you know, we need a hate law to stop you doing that? No, no, it's none of those reasons because we don't have enough constables at the front line and the ones we do are not allowed to undertake stop and search in the way they used to be able to. They're not allowed to preemptively act against people who they perceive to be a problem. They used to be able to do that before the 2010 general election, ironically under a Labour government, and it was very successful and we had much lower street crime. Uh, Passing a new law that isn't enforced, or enforceable in fact, um, doesn't affect anything Actually, you want to reduce crime, which I would hope we all want to do, you enforce the laws that are there already. Absolutely. There's more than sufficient laws to uh, to deal with these matters, as you say, um, already. Um, but what do, what do the listeners think? Um, you can contact us via Twitter, as we've said. Uh, please do get in touch and let us know what you, what you think about these matters. Um, Moving on to a very local issue, and we always like to discuss what Croydon Council has been up to. Um, We've previously discussed their views on art, or their very strange views on art. Um, Mike, I understand that Croydon Council has recently gone into the market for purchasing hotels. Uh, Can you tell our listeners a little bit about this? Yeah, uh, uh, Councillor Tony's uh, setting up his own B&B business, it appears now, so... Just recently, uh, Croydon Council have purchased the freeholds to the land that the Croydon Park Hotel is on. So there are conflicting reports uh, uh, about the cost of the purchase of 25 million or could be as high as 29.8 million. And the Croydon Park Hotel is in central Croydon, not far from East Croydon Station and, and just opposite the law courts, if anyone, most I'm sure many of you will know it if you're from the area now the council has has purchased this um given the re- giving the reason that um they they need to raise money and and i'll quote councillor simon hall the cabinet member for finance and resources at a time when the government grant funding for local authorities continues to fall we have to look at new and innov- innovative ways to ensure we can provide services to residents and the reason being, they believe they will raise a million pounds worth of income a year from this purchase. Now, 
the challenge here is, if it were that easy, if you just purchase some land and raise a million pounds a year from it, why aren't we all doing it? Why isn't a private investor doing it? Maybe there's a bit more complexity to that. Maybe it's actually quite hard to raise that money and keep raising it. Maybe there are other ways to raise money. And then you raise the question, are the council best suited to make that investment decision? Is Councillor Hall, who who I've met on numerous occasions, is a you know incredibly friendly and, and well-spoken chap, is he actually a hotel financier boffin or is he just a councillor from Yaddington? Um, you've got to wonder if, if they've really got the sums right here. That's actually not the worst part of this. Uh, but I will just keep keep on with the sums here. I don't know, Dan, what's, what do you think the interest might be on on uh, 29.8 million? Because remember, listeners, Croydon Council hasn't got any money. It's a billion pounds in debt. So they've had to borrow this money to spend it. Dan, any thoughts on what might be uh, might be the spend there? So, what was it, 29 million? What, a million pounds a year interest? Uh, well, exactly. I mean, I, we don't know. Uh, sorry, I, I put you on the spot there. We don't know. Because Coin Council haven't published any figures around this. Uh-huh. Why would they do that? That would be of use. Uh, they didn't even tell any Labour councillors uh, before it came out in the press, by all accounts. Or not, not any of the, the non, non-Cabinet members. Even if Croydon are only paying 1% interest, that's £300,000 a year. So suddenly that million pounds of income is massively reduced. But my real concern here is, is government picking winners and losers. Croydon Council is now in the hotel business. Croydon Council has a vested interest in the Croydon Park Hotel being successful and therefore may also have a vested interest in other hotels in Croydon not having the same success, not taking competition away from them. Now, what's the what's the kind of risks of that? I don't know, Dan, can you think of any risks around that? Oh, I don't know. Um, maybe if another hotel in the area wants to uh, expand their business or if somebody wants to build another hotel in the area, that might be competition for now, the Croydon Park Hotel. Um maybe the council may have to think twice about granting that planning permission. Clearly, th- there's no way that council should be buying hotels, or in this case, or the freehold of hotels. Uh, the Croydon Council doesn't have that much money. It needs to spend its money very, very wisely, and it should be spending its money well on things like children's services, uh, which are, at the moment in time, in Croydon, a total shambles. Apparently, they think they are property magnets now. Uh, I'm afraid they're not. And, of course, they've had such success already on that front, being that I'm pretty confident brick by brick are still yet to deliver any housing for the people of Croydon. Uh, This is the Croydon's brick by brick being Croydon's specialist agency in building affordable homes for the, the people of Croydon. There's a massive conflict of interest there, whereby the Cabinet Minister for Housing... Uh, is married to the chair of the planning committee. So uh, there's no, you know, there's a real risk, and I only put it like that, there's a real risk that the chair of the planning committee might look favourably upon suggestions that come from his wife's department. Not saying they do, not saying they aren't acting fully independently. Just think it might be a risk. But that's been a shambles. That's created huge problems across Croydon with Brick by Brick and their proposals. But... But to compound it, and to compound the failure to deliver Westfield, the failure to deliver the Fairfield, the failure to deliver the new Addington Leisure Centre on budget, we're now a hotel company as well for for Croydon Council. And I say we because, of course, we, the taxpayers of Croydon, are going to pick up the tab when this undoubtedly once again fails. But will we get access to the minibar? That is the question. Um, so if you have any stories about Croydon Council or any of the other councils in the South London area, we would like to, uh, we'd love to hear about them. Uh, so you can contact us uh, in the usual way. Um, just before we, we wrap up uh, this episode of the, uh, of the podcast, we'd just like to let you know about a little offshoot we've, uh, we've set up called the Pubcast. Uh, so our podcast lasts for roughly half an hour or so. Uh, but we've set up a, a shorter version of the podcast called a Pubcast, uh, where Mike and I and others 
possibly a pop along to a local taverna and uh, and have a few beers and we just like to have a little chat about something and um, we'd invite you to listen into that it's a, a more conversational piece if you like um, and that's that podcast is available are now on youtube stitcher and the apple podcast um, Mike, what future events have we have we got coming up over the next couple of months? So, as mentioned, we, we're out in Addiscombe on the 17th of November for a Brexit street stall and Thornton Heath on the 24th of November for a Brexit street stall. Come along, get involved, remind the people why we voted Brexit and how important it is that we put pressure on our MPs to make sure we get the Brexit Britain voted for. Cheers. Uh, as you say, please do get in touch. Uh, we're on Twitter at, at Croydon Const. Uh, we've got a Facebook page. We can get in touch via the website at croydonconstitutionalist.uk uh, or via email at croydonconstitutionalist at gmail.com. Uh, that's all we've got time for on this podcast. Uh, we will have another podcast out shortly. Uh, do like and subscribe via your podcast apps. Um, Until then, it's uh, goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Goodbye.